Good afternoon. My name is Mike Pirro, Superintendent of Pittsburgh Schools. I would like to thank our viewers for attending this afternoon. The purpose of this second forum is to further answer questions to the best of our ability. In answering questions, we promise a sense of transparency and our best thinking at this moment. To date, we've received over 50 pages of questions. The questions have been grouped into like categories and due to the replication of many questions, we've been able to consolidate our question and answer section to about 16 pages or so. The question and answer document has been updated almost daily. We will begin with questions today that have been submitted recently and have not yet been answered. We will then move to live questions using the chat feature. Any questions that we do not get to uh, or were not answered within this hour will be addressed within our question and answer document. I'd like to formally begin uh, by asking our panel members to introduce themselves, starting with uh, Dwayne. Good afternoon. I'm Dwayne Sabone. I'm president of the Pittsburgh District Teachers Association. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Palucio, PTSA president. Hello, I'm Melanie Ward, Assistant Superintendent for Instruction. Good afternoon, I'm Sean Clark, President of the Administrators Association. Hi, I'm Amy Thomas and I'm the Board President. Mike Leone, Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources. Hello, I'm Patricia Von Brogan, Director of Student Services. Darren Kenny, Assistant Superintendent of Finance. Jeff Kimmer, Chief Information Officer. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Woods, the Director of Special Education. Thank you. I'd like to thank these members in particular for their commitment uh, and for being here uh, throughout our forums and for their um, work in answering our questions today. I'd also like to thank our teachers, our nurses, our administrators, our board members, our secretaries, our parents, and our community and staff for being so thoughtful and cooperative throughout this process. I also need to acknowledge the toll that this pandemic has had on all of us uh, and, and continues to take on all of us. In a typical crisis, we're able to work hard, we're able to work together, and we usually have a relatively quick resolve. In this case, all of our stamina has been tested uh, over and over and over again, and it continues to be as we go into about the six month time frame of working through logistics and, and the pandemic. Internally, we're not only contending with normal summer work, but a highly intense and emotional environment as teacher and administrative leaders in particular have been working very hard on recreating schools. Knowing that as we recreate schools in the end, not everyone is going to be satisfied. Families, including our staff, are grappling with issues like childcare, safety of our schools, and a sense of normalcy, including missed opportunities for students and children as we enter the school year, including things like athletics, several clubs, and full socialization. On top of all this, we recognize that there continues to be a wide range of thoughts within our community, internally and externally, with regards to shutting down schools and going fully remote, to having every single student attend uh, school every day in person, and many people are in between. Typically, it takes us from about January to June, around six months, to schedule the following year. We've been tasked to do this from July to August this year, and doing so with a myriad of COVID-19 restrictions and regulations, many which are added and changed throughout. I have the utmost respect for those that I have taken this on with, because at times it seems like an impossible task as we dive into logistics um, daily. And so the people that are at this table and beyond, uh, I can't thank them enough. Uh, we're living through a historical event. And until we land on the other side, our lives will continue to have sacrifice and we will continue to have interruptions. Schools are no different than our homes right now. Things have been turned upside down. There's going to be sacrifices within our schools and schools certainly will not be perfect, but we will uh, certainly be committed to continuous improvement. I ask for your partnership. I ask for your patience as we continue to do everything we can to provide the best opportunities and experiences for our students, our staff, our families, and our community, albeit in a very altered way. 
without going into a presentation regarding uh, where were uh, our different learning models. I think we've been very clear with that. I'm going to go right into the questions that have been submitted in the last couple of days. And these are primarily uh, been asked in order. There are quite a few. Uh, and again, if we get through these, then we will go to the live chat. Question one, when will we be told the details of our teams and days of attendance, procedures for drop-off pickup, so parents can coordinate with our own work schedules? As of right now, we've had our nine buildings submit drop-off and pickup procedures. Now, the current status of them is they are in the hands of, just in the hands of our director of operations, our director of transportation, they will then be finalized uh, through our district health and safety. Given uh, the amount of parents, uh, and thank you for this, that have agreed to drive their children this year, uh, we are looking at reconfiguring uh, several of our drop-off and pick-up procedures, uh, as well as our drop-off and pick-up windows of times. Regarding uh, details of days that you're in schedule, and or days you were in session, and scheduled, and schedules, and, and mailings, uh, we're at the point, um, and Melanie, maybe you can clarify this, that we're, we're hoping for later next week. Yeah. Uh, at the secondary levels, um, at all levels, really, we're looking at enrollment numbers to make sure we make those divisions appropriately, and we should be there by the middle of next week, I would say. Right. Can you please provide an update on the percentage of elementary families that have currently chosen in-person versus remote? As of today, uh, we have... Um, approximately 15% of elementary students that are have selected remote and at the secondary level it seems to be closer to about 10% for the the remote learning buildings are between 80 and 90% in person at the elementary schools and just a reminder and, and I want to send another thank you we're at nearly 100% of people that have selected a program as of today. Uh, tomorrow at 4 o'clock will be uh, our, our deadline. So thank you for, um, for being responsive to that request. What is the plan if the schools are once, against, once again closed? Will the students that selected remote to begin with stay in the same class? There are a couple scenarios that, that we're planning for. There's many scenarios that we're planning for. Uh, and, and I'm not sure what's going to happen between now and September, but we're prepared for just about anything. One thing that we've always had in our minds is what happens if we do all of this work to start school and uh, then we're unable to uh, through executive order or through different decisions that are, um, are, are provided to us. So one option is if we go all remote, then all students will be put in a cohort and they will be um, with the, the, their same classes with the same teacher in front of them. If we start school like we're planning to start, then students will be in the selected remote will be in a remote cohort. The students that chose hybrid will be in a hybrid cohort. And if we're told that we have to close, we're going to continue in those cohorts. Uh, and, and again, we could be possibly not closing. We could be closing in September sometime. Our thinking around this is that our students have built a relationship with the, the teacher and other staff members that they may be in front of. Uh, and for continuity of uh, a lot of things, it's important to keep the students uh, together with, with that adult and, and the students that they're currently working with. Anyone have anything to add on that? What is, for the hybrid model, what will instruction look like on Wednesdays? Are we following the full 40 minute periods or are they shortened periods? And check that. Happy to address that. Um, we're, we're actually working with some of our teacher leaders right now to develop a, a bank of uh, best practices for how we would use the Wednesday full remote day at the secondary level. One of the things that um, we're keeping in mind there is that that will be the only day of the week where an entire class will be able to come together in one setting. 
um, given it will be a, a virtual remote setting, but it will be the only time that, for example, all 24 students can see each other and the teacher at the same time in the same space. So um, there are lots of different conversations happening about how you use that time. Um, some whole group instruction, some small group instruction, putting kids, um, having kids collaborate with each other that they don't get to see and work with in, in person. Uh, what we do know is that every teacher will be expected to be providing some level of synchronous instruction with all of their students on Wednesdays, um, but we need to allow our teachers to plan for the use of that time um, given their professional skill set around solid instructional planning um, to be able to make the best use of that time with their whole class. Um, again, knowing that it's a, a full class, there might be opportunities for some social emotional community building experiences, some checking in in general. Um, there may be some, um, some times where that's a period that's used for some assessment because it's an assessment that can be given independently and in a secure way. And rather than use time, uh, some of that precious time with the teacher, uh, that might be a, an option for them. But we're, we're building a bank so that Wednesdays are very, a very meaningful and creative opportunity to keep instruction moving forward in all courses for all students. There's three questions I'm going to read in a row. Are there orientations for students entering sixth and ninth grade? Will the students be able to come to school ahead of the first day to organize their lockers? My son is an eighth grade web leader. Will this program still be taking place? Uh, the, the students will not be using lockers this year, so that's a, a relatively easy answer, uh, with the exception of Menden Center Elementary School. Our elementary, all of our five elementary schools are configured a little bit differently with four of them having cubbies for students to store things in. Menden Center does not have the cubbies, so we're allowing for lockers. The secondary lo level, we are not permitting the use of lockers uh, as we're trying to avoid large group gatherings. And uh, the way our lockers are configured, students would be uh, pretty close to one another. Uh, Melanie, do you want to talk about orientations and web leaders? Sure, yep. Uh, middle schools and high schools are continuing to plan for a modified version of sixth grade and ninth grade orientation using our web and link leaders. So that work has already been underway with the advisors working with the web and link, la link leaders to plan for orientation. Kids will be invited into the buildings in smaller groups for a much modified experience from what it typically looks like. Um, but we recognize the importance of incoming sixth graders and incoming ninth graders having an opportunity to see the building. Um, I know at the middle schools are talking about a little bit of a tech training experience as part of that um, orientation as well. Uh, in addition, and it's not specific in this question, I think it might come up later though, we are looking at each of our elementary buildings at again, a small modified version of a kindergarten orientation experience for our incoming kindergarten children as well. Will sixth grade students new to middle school and choosing all remote still be assigned to a team. S students that are uh, in remote will be assigned to their own uh, teachers. And so we are not going to be um, assigning remote students to a team of teachers. And uh, there's more questions about remote learning that I'll address uh, shortly, but in, in essence, we have, uh, as of tomorrow, Literally, as of today, we, we pretty much have everyone's selections uh, in. And at this point, what we can do now is begin to build our schedule. Uh, again, which is um, going to be all hands on deck to, to make that happen. And we're going to build our schedules around how many students are in school, in person, in hybrid. And look at the additional teachers that are needed uh, to support our remote learners. There's, there's a question here uh, that's as a follow-up to that. Uh, I do understand why you're grouping remote learners separate. Based on your comments in the last Q&A, you need to find additional teachers for the remote learners. Isn't that more expensive than just providing each class with video streaming capabilities? It seems like you are making this much more complicated than it needs to be. So <laughs> you're right. I, I, I think that this is incredibly complex. There's, there's so many nuances to, to everything that we're doing to open schools. Uh, 
part of the answer to this comes down to um, our belief that when you are a teacher of record, or you're a teacher in front of students or a teacher in front of um, whether it's 10 or, or 25 in person or remotely, you're responsible for those 10 or 12 students or 25 students. You're responsible for the classroom environment. Um, you're responsible for interactions and following up with the students. So for pedagogical reasons, we believe that it's better for students uh, to have and be assigned to uh, a dedicated teacher. And w one of the things that, that is worrisome to us with, with streaming our, our classes and having teachers duly responsible for those at home and in front of them uh, is that we don't have, uh, no one has the capacity to monitor both environments. And, and it becomes uh, an issue. We're responsible for cyberbullying. Uh, we're res responsible to see how students are interacting, what they're doing, um, integrity of, of taking assessments, uh, providing feedback. And developmentally uh, and pedagogically, we feel it's in students' best interest uh, to separate the remote learners from the um, from those that are in, in in class at the same time without question it would be easier to say let's just do this um, but we have never been uh, the district that says let's take the easy way uh, rather what's what do we feel is, is best for students as far as additional staffing uh, the way um, we have been able to create the model uh, and we're yet to see what what types of additional staffing we're going to need uh, we've already spent uh, additional funding just for COVID-related uh, issues alone. Uh, the, the funding part of this uh, has been exorbitant uh, without even getting into staffing. We're fortunate in that we have um, the, the capability to use paraprofessionals uh, and assign staff in, in creative ways, which has been a remarkable um, way that we've worked with our, our teachers and our teachers' union and so we'll get to the scheduling part and then we'll place uh, teachers with students uh, accordingly. I do see where we'll probably need uh, additional staffing is probably in uh, building substitute teachers. Uh, really concerned about how we start the school year and the pool of subs that we have. Uh, and when, if there's anything that would close school down, it would be one of the things is not having teachers to cover classes. So I'm, I'm very, really concerned about um, our substitute teacher bank and, and those that um, are not coming back out of fear uh, for uh, COVID-19. So if you're interested in subbing, please um, go to the HR portion of our website and, and put in your application. We'd be happy to speed that up. Why was it decided to group hybrid students Monday, Thursday, and Tuesday, Friday? If students went either Monday or Tuesday or Thursday or Friday, the school would not have to be cleaned as thoroughly on Monday and Thursday evenings because the same group of students would be going the next day. Very good point. It's, it actually is a, val a valid point. We had to make the decision if we had the same group of students going Monday, Tuesday, that then they would be remote and not in front of the teacher Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So going full five full days uh, without being in front of, of his or her teacher, which uh, we felt was far outweighed um, the, the disinfecting that we felt we could do in our current plan. Will there be any unstructured yet supervised virtual time in either for the remote model or on hybrid virtual days to encourage socialization between students? something that would stimulate recess, simulate recess. I'm going to start, then I'm going to turn it over. Um, we, in all of our meetings, we understand the importance of socialization. Uh, we understand the importance of social emotional learning. Uh, we have plans in place to continue recess at the elementary level. We have uh, plans in place uh, where Teachers will be allowed to take students outside. Um, there will be times where uh, lessons are, are focused on social emotional learning and, and socialization. The, the, the hardest part is students are going to come into to school and staff with masks on and they're going to be six feet away. And, and then we have to create the environment where 
that becomes the normal for now. Uh, and we look at our values around um, social emotional learning again and, and, and how to make that happen. So for example, at the elementary level, one of a, the a, a great practices that we've always had has been working through stations and small groups. Uh, that might look a little bit different. So instead of having four kids in a station and rotating around the classroom, there may be two students at a station, which I think is, is an example of how we can enhance socialization. I don't know if anyone on the panel has anything to add there. I'll, I'll just jump in and add. So we talked a little bit about Wednesdays in the hybrid model at the secondary level being an opportunity for the whole group to connect and have some time for community building, relationship establishment, et cetera. At the elementary level for families who are choosing the full-time remote option for their children, we have said that every single day, the day will start with a full class synchronous community meeting experience so that all of the children and teachers are together for a few minutes um, every morning for again, some community building time, some socialization, some social emotional check-ins, et cetera. Um, it, it is going to be challenging for us to think about um, socialization in the, in the way we've thought about it. Um, previously, we had a long conversation yesterday with an elementary planning group about recess um, and the need to um, absolutely continue to provide recess on a daily basis, but um, thinking about how to do that in a socially distanced manner, um, keeping kids safe, um, but providing them with um, still some, some less structured time in the day that is so important to their development. So it's certainly on our minds. Uh, Dwayne? Thank you. If I could just speak to this a moment as well, I'd just like to um, share that uh, professional staff, certificated staff, have been working significantly this summer through professional learning opportunities to address um, both the long-term effects coming out of last year as well as the um, ongoing going into this year, um, being responsive to the changes that have occurred for our students and recognizing that um, Normally, there are always social and emotional challenges that we're addressing with the uh, challenges that are before us, that they're unique, and that we need to be responsive to that. Uh, a lot of discussions in uh, small groups and in departmental grade level in order to be responsive to that. So thank you. Thank you, Duane. Will there be additional changes to the school calendar as a result of the one-week delay or otherwise? As far as a start and end date, uh, there uh, should not be any significant changes. Again, the, the caveat is uh, we don't know what may happen with regards to executive orders. Uh, we, we still have um, are obligated for the 180-day rule, uh, which means we, we have to be in school 180 days. Our calendars are going to look a lot more empty uh, than typical because we – have removed for now uh, the, the different ensembles, musicals, um, sporting events, homecoming, all those types of things have been removed uh, knowing that uh, we, we do not have the, the green light uh, via statute to allow those to, to continue. The one thing we are talking about as of yesterday uh, was looking at that first week that we're back at the secondary level um, being just a little bit different because school starts on a Tuesday, uh, which gives us four days that week, we may remove that Wednesday plan uh, so that we can have students uh, in both cohorts be in two days that week. So we can still do a Tuesday, Thursday group uh, and a Wednesday, Friday group, knowing that that Wednesday group is really would have been the Monday group, if that, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, so more more to come with regards to the first week at secondary, but um, it uh, again the, the thinking is how can we get students in in, in a more uh, effective manner that first week. If schools are forced to close shortly into the year, will remote learners in six twelve be able to move to a similar schedule than hybrid learners have? Our our plan is to keep cohorts together. Uh, our plan is to have students, when they're assigned at the very beginning, to stay with that teacher in that cohort. I am a student at Calkins Road, and I'm wondering if I were to do virtual, would I be learning the same thing at the same pace as the students doing hybrid? 
In addition, once I return to school classes, would I be with my regular team? The, 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 the pacing of courses should be very similar. Uh, the concern more with remote uh, is, from, from my perspective, is that we may not, and I would preface this with the word may, be able to offer the same breadth of programs given the amount of electives that we have, primarily uh, at the, the high school level. As it, if we start the year and then let's say you start in remote and then uh, the governor lifts all restrictions and um, th there aren't concerns about the pandemic and we return to full in school, um, we're going to make the decision uh, around how that would look and at about the 10 week period. That's my way of saying we're not 100% sure yet. How many students will be in one class? Uh, each class is based on the square footage of, of a room. So it's possible to have uh, 10 students in a room. It's possible to have 20 students in a room. Again, it's based on square footage and six feet social distancing. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, virtually, how many children will be in one class? By grade level, uh, virtual class sizes will probably not exceed 25. Is that fair? Using the same. Yeah. So it's, it's, it'll be the it, it will be right around 25, 26 or less, right right in those that, that area. I would like to know why the school district is not offering virtual classroom for high school students. Our Lady of Mercy High School and McQuaid Jesuit are live streaming every class every day as the students go through their schedule. The students that are in school two days a week sit in the classroom while the other others who are not live stream and vice versa on the other days. I find the fact that Pittsburgh is not able to do this the same thing very questionable. Please explain why as a district do not have the same capabilities as a private Catholic school. I think that the simplest way to answer that is that we we do have the same capabilities. Uh, we, we we choose uh, to look at uh, treating the two models very differently uh, because of the understanding relative to pedagogy and classroom environment and being responsible for uh, your classroom uh, virtually versus in person. The other part to the, the hybrid model, uh, I think that if we can shift our thinking a little bit regarding the model, there, there, I'm not sure if the right word is the likelihood, but there certainly is a, a, a significant possibility that we may close at some point during the year, uh, that schools may close. It's, it's possible. And with the hybrid model, it allows students uh, to be in school, uh, learning how to access and utilize the different technology platforms, uh, understanding um, what those routines will look like, and it would offer a very seamless way to transition to remote. Once remote, uh, students will follow a schedule, um, and, and from that point forward, it would be very similar to the two schools that you mentioned. Is there anything anyone wants to add there? Again, I think I think I would just answer that the concept of um, being able to provide instructions in those two um, platforms is significantly different. And in order to do each one of them to the best of our ability, it's important to be able to focus on the unique attributes of those platforms, whether in class, in person, or remotely. And I think by dividing them, it gives us that maximum ability to um, be able to address the skill sets, the delivery methods, and the student supports needed within each one of those. If my child chooses the hybrid option and then needs to go remote because they are required to quarantine or if they get ill, will they have to switch teachers since there is a different group of teachers using the remote kids? Is it different if it, if it was like my child was needing to quarantine versus the whole class needing to quarantine? This is a, one of the reasons why it's, it's a benefit 
to group students in different cohorts. If someone does get ill and have to quarantine, they are still under the roster of the teacher. And so they would not be switching classes or switching courses or switching teachers. During a regular school year, we have students that have extended medical illnesses and we're still responsible for their instruction. When that happens, uh, we're typically not moving them, him or her, um, out of uh, their, their traditional schedule. Uh, so we would be treating that particular scenario as if uh, that child would stay uh, where they are um, with the, their current teacher. I have had many conversations with parents who are sending their kids to see how it goes with the intent to pull them out if it is not working. What are the plans for those kids? Will they be placed in existing remote learning classes or will new ones be created? But I, I'm hoping that there's a, a strong sense of fidelity uh, with, with our plans for return from parent selection. I'm not sure what that means where we're going to test the waters or try something for a little bit and then pull out um, if, if we need to um, or if we, if we don't like it. Our, our sol your selection, um, for a, a ton of reasons, needs to, to remain intact uh, from now until the, the end of the first semester. The amount of, of time, uh, the lack of time that we have to schedule students right now um, is, is concerning. And then we will not be able to move students in and out of models uh, throughout the course of the year. It's, it, it becomes unsafe for us. It becomes a management issue. And it would honestly um, be detrimental to, to their educational experience. So I'm, I'm hoping that, that people aren't planning to try to um, test both waters and see what they have and then um, hope that there's a, a selection that, that they can then choose from. At the beginning, I, I asked for um, us to work as partners, uh, to be uh, patient, uh, and to work with one another. Uh, I also mentioned that the year is going to be different. The, the start of school is going to be different regardless of what model you're in, and we have to give each model time. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for us uh, to accommodate requests to go in and out of models. Does anyone have anything to add there? If students that select remote in the fall transition back to in-person in the winter, how will trans transition look to another class or teacher? I, I would just, I told you at the beginning we'd be fully transparent. I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, that is on our next tier of thinking and planning. If any events happen in person during the fall, will students that select remote be able to participate? Regardless of the model that you choose, you're a Pittsburgh student, you're a Pittsburgh family. Um, our job is to make sure you feel connected and understand uh, that you're um, a, a Pittsburgh student. So if you're remote and we have a function at school, 100% uh, not only are you invited, but we, uh, we would want you there. If I withdraw my elementary school age to homeschool, can I re-enroll her in January for in-person learning? Sh sure. You, you can choose to homeschool your child at any time and then choose not to homeschool your, your child at any time. Is there anything you want to add there, Pat? There are some regulations associated with that, but certainly given this time, we want to be as flexible as possible so if you choose homeschooling for the first semester and you decide you want to do something differently certainly we would honor that how will you verify academic honesty do you want to talk about any of the conversations so it's a that's an important question as we're thinking about students potentially taking classroom assessments in the remote environment we do um, expect our kids to uphold academic integrity and honesty it's it's a conversation particularly particularly at the secondary level every year we have talked about um, being perhaps a little bit more deliberate in each class about having kids um, sign off on an academic honesty statement particularly as it relates to their work in the remote environment how will testing work for middle school students in remote learning or on hybrid virtual days? For hybrid students, will testing only be in person 
or only virtual or a mix of both? Uh, the, the simple answer is that it will be a mix of both. And, and all of us right now are looking at uh, how do we create assessments that may be a little bit more authentic where academic honesty uh, can be taken out of the equation. Uh, but certainly we're going to be relying on students to sign off uh, and have a level of integrity. And again, uh, we certainly have processes and, and, um, and different software that we can use to, to check to make sure students um, are, aren't plagiarizing or um, what we would go through a normal investigation, even if remote, if students keep sending in similar answers as one another. My concern is that the internet connection is not 100% reliable. In fact, one of those reasons that I felt remote learning should not be graded is because we cannot guarantee internet connectivity. What kind of options or resources would be available for students if connectivity were an issue? First, I, I would, around the, the topic of technology, uh, we've had requests for, uh, I believe, 600 and um, something additional laptops for students in grades 6 through 12 and we are able to accommodate that so all students uh, will have access to uh, to technology regarding internet going in and out uh, if you were at this last forum uh, my connectivity went out and um, we need we need to have uh, an understanding uh, that 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 can happen if there's additional problems with connectivity we would also ask you to submit um, a ticket for technology help where we can actually uh, send someone there or have you drop off uh, something to us to look to see if there's a problem with uh, th that we can support. We're also working on uh, Wi-Fi access uh, should that be helpful. So in other words, if you have an assessment that's due during this block of time and connectivity is an issue, we've seen that you've signed in but you can't submit it, we would have a process for you then to email the teacher or letting um, certainly the teacher know that you're having trouble with connectivity or you had trouble. We, we want to be helpful during this time. Uh, we, we don't want to um, cause more stress. Whom did the district consult with regarding mental health impact on this new setting and what it will have on students? Was it a local mental health professional? Did they have any input in determining the length of the school day? Were they on the committee? Uh, that develop the temporary learning models. How do you envision a child socializing in this setting? How many hours do you envision a child sitting at their desk during the school day? How about during days with an inclement weather? Uh, Dr. Brogan, would you like to just start with maybe the first half? Yes, I'll start with that first part. First, I wanted to share that we have a very strong cadre of mental health staff within the district, school psychologists, school counselors, social workers, nurses, et cetera. And we have regular consultation from the University of Rochester Medical Center, Dr. Melissa Heatley and Dr. James Wallace. So um, they were not on the committee, but they consult with my department and my staff uh, throughout the year and in particular in relationship to this closure and, and reopening. How many hours do you envision a child sitting at their desk during the school day? Well, we have, um, we, we know it, it's, if we're talking about student engagement, that sitting at the desk throughout the entire day is not a good practice. At the secondary level, if, at the high school level, students will be getting up every period and they'll be changing classes. At the middle school level, uh, there will be um, exchanges where students leave their classes. Uh, students will be going to and from uh, lunch, uh, and then uh, at, at different levels they'll have, they'll have different opportunities. At the elementary level, we see students um, within the classroom having multiple opportunities to uh, move around if it's station work, if it's recess, if it's lunch, if it's snack time. Uh, we also will be giving several mask breaks throughout the day. We'll be asking teachers to think about creative spaces and taking students outside. Uh, so I don't see um, seat time uh, being something that 
is going to be a hindrance to, to a student's mental health. Uh, we're, going, we're very cognizant of student movement and how, how important that is. Anyone else want to follow up with that? Okay. What is the district's overall expectation of teachers pro for providing synchronous instruction on the two days at home? Melanie, do you want to go into that a little bit? Sure. We've posted a lot of this. Yeah, we we do have a lot of uh, information in our FAQ document, which continues to be updated daily. Um, and we've really expanded that document relative to questions about uh, the hybrid model as well as the remote and in-person models. Um, in terms of those days that students are at home and not in front of their teachers, um, we do expect them to continue to follow their um, regular schedule. Um, we are responsible for attendance for every student, every period. And so teachers will be crafting experiences um, for students, meaningful experiences that continue to move the learning and the curriculum forward on those days with some kind of um, way to um, account for kids' attendance and engagement in that learning every day. And it could take a variety of formats through, you know, everything from a, a quick check-in through Teams to an application that kids are working on um, and then submit some material to their, to their teacher. Our thinking is that to a large extent, teachers will have set kids up for their remote days. Um, the previous day when students have been in school, they will have received some direction around what they need to do. And then um, more information will be available to them, <clears throat> excuse me, in teams on a regular basis. So kids are following their schedule. They're continuing with the learning progressions as they're laid out by their teachers. Um, and our teachers are using um, their, their growing toolbox of, um, of instructional methodology to, to keep kids moving forward. I'm going to continue with you, Melanie. Will teachers be teaching the exact same lesson twice a week? once for the Monday and Thursday students, and then again for the Tuesday, Friday students. How are students expected to be fully prepared for AP expectations if this is the case? So I think to some extent there may be some of that, that repeat of the lessons um, because, again, we want to make sure that every student has equitable access to the learning that they're expected to, to go through. So teachers might be teaching the same lesson on Monday, and then they're repeating that lesson on Tuesday. But on Tuesday, the kids who receive that lesson on Monday are taking steps forward with the learning as directed by the teacher. So teachers are right now engaged in thinking very carefully about what are the things that I most need to do with my kids when they're in the room with me, and then what are the things that my students can do and should do on the days that they're not with me to continue my learning plan moving forward. There is an expectation that the curriculum is covered during the year. Um, we've been really um, clear about the fact that we still anticipate Regents exams and AP exams and any other kind of assessment to be on the table this year. So we can't look at the hybrid model as um, we're cutting in half the amount of learning our kids are doing because they're only in front of our teachers two days a week. They will continue to move that forward. This is a lot of the professional learning work that our teachers have been engaged in this summer and will continue to be engaged in as we enter the school year to make those really critical decisions about how to use in-person days versus remote days to continue learning moving forward so kids experience the essentials of the full curriculum. And I, I don't know, Duane, if you want to add anything. You'll yeah, be one of those teachers doing that. Th so. Thank you. I, I appreciate the way you captured that. Um, one of the really important things to remember is that we're not taking what we did two years ago or last year at the beginning of the year and just cutting it up into two days. It really, um, that would really disrespect the work that's going into what we're doing right now. It, it, I think the question actually demonstrates the amount of work that our um, staff is putting into redesigning the work that we do in order to make sure that that curriculum can still move ahead and that the students in each one of those unique environments are getting the full experiences that are matched to that specific environment and platform that they're engaged in that day. So I think it was well stated, Melanie. Thank you. What percent of time will elementary school students be with and away from their classroom teachers while in school? Prob probably about 50% 50, 50 would, would be the, the ballpark uh, percentage. There will be times when the elementary 
student may also be with a special area teacher. Uh, our special area classes uh, will continue uh, for the for the most part. They may be less. They will be less than they were when we were in person by about 50 percent uh, of, of duration and frequency. Uh, students will either be in front of their teacher 50 percent of the time and or will be around 50 percent of the time and the other 50 percent of the time they will either be with another certified teacher, they may be in a special area class, or they may be with a paraprofessional. Um, but, but regardless of where they are, um, there is um, a direct connection between uh, the two locations and the classroom teacher. How will the district in real time be evaluating the efficacy of instruction under each model? La as I, I think that Many of us have our minds uh, in a place where we were in, in March, and I know that um, we are internally well beyond that. Uh, we, we, we have set up systems and structures where um, remote learning, if we all go remote learning, um, we're, we're down to single platform use uh, for grade levels. We are having students follow a schedule. Uh, we have um, introduced more effective formative feedback and, and assessment models. We have brought grading back. Uh, we um, will continue with report cards. Uh, regarding the efficacy um, of how we're doing would more than likely be a check-in with um, parents and um, community and our teachers and our administrators uh, around um, what's working well, what's not working well. We're, we're a district is committed um, to doing the best we can and, and to continue to get better and so us as a district being able to dipstick and check how we're doing along the way will be critical I don't know if there's anything else anyone wants to add okay we're going to go into a few questions around electives and then we're going to get into facilities it seems like there is a possibility that the school may not be able to accommodate his course selection through remote learning. Then what? If his electives cannot be accommodated, will the school work with us to help identify options? Yes. So, so we, we will provide um, what is available to students via remote. I, I believe that's probably where the question is coming from. Um, if it's, if it's, hybrid model um, or an in-person model would probably be hybrid model there shouldn't be too many electives that are impacted here if it's a remote environment uh, those elective options uh, will more than likely be limited it's a, it's a strength for us and and, and it's kind of a, a weakness in in this regard we have a robust amount a, a tremendous breadth of electives that we offer our challenge for uh, remote learning uh, is that we will not be able to offer that same breadth um, of electives for our uh, remote learners, uh, but there uh, should certainly be options uh, for students in, in, um, in that model. My friends and my kids are currently in the instructional challenge programs offered at the elementary and middle schools. Will these programs be continued during the coming school year? I don't know if I've been involved in that conversation yet. So uh, again, sort of in the theme of, of complete transparency, I think this is a bit of an unknown, uh, particularly at the elementary level, where we are currently continuing to work through staffing for all of the kids and all of the, 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 the pods or the groupings across the elementary and needing to deploy as many staff as possible um, to meet those needs of our students. So um, I can't, I would not be able to sit here today and say that we will be able to continue to offer the same degree of small group instructional challenge work at our elementary buildings under these circumstances as we um, would strongly desire to. Um, we're certainly going to do our best to meet the needs of all of our students, but I, it would be um, disingenuous to answer in any other way at this point. Thank you, Melanie. Will the double acceleration program be kept at Calkins Road this fall? That's a pretty specific question. So 
So, so the we're not, to my knowledge, the the double accelerated math classes will continue to run as per usual. I think part of what's under this question is, on occasion, we have students who are elementary age students who get bussed over for those programs, and I know the principals are working on those arrangements as we speak. Thank you, and I think that should address the bullet underneath the question around: Will if my child is in elementary, will they be able to attend middle school for acceleration? For high school students who will be learning 100% remotely and may not have access to electives, will PCSD be working with MCC to expand the dual enrollment classes available in the fall, especially in areas like art? Me again? Uh, so we recognize that for uh, many of our students in the remote model at the high school, their choice of electives will be limited. Um, and we've had some conversation with the high school principals about the importance of being flexible and thinking about um, the opportunity to award high school credit um, for a course taken at uh, MCC, for example, that is within a high school principal's purview. They are able to award credit in that way. It does not require us to go through the dual enrollment uh, option, which is a whole lot of red tape and not something that really makes sense at this point. Our interest is um, in being flexible and saying if a family wants to seek out another opportunity for a student to experience something that we are not able to provide, we certainly would want to work with that family around that. Another question around AP classes. If these classes are not offered to remote kids at the beginning of the, the school year, Shall I assume you will let her jump back into her desired curriculum, APs and honors classes, on January 29th? Shall I assume you will reconsider those requirements for the students who had to choose remote for the sake of their family's health and were not offered the classes they needed or wanted or planned for for the year and allow them to get right back on track regardless of what classes they had available to them this school year? That, that, that's a re that's a really tough question. Um, as of right now, we we do not see a a way for a student that's missed half the year of of AP to come back and join in January. And, and saying that out loud puts a little pit in my my stomach um, because it's indicative of something that's out of your child's control um, and and may feel that they're um, being penalized for that. What I don't know yet uh, is what AP classes and electives we'll have to offer. We're going to do our best to offer what we can, uh, and then we will do our best to work with students beyond this year uh, to look at um, additional opportunities for them to um, enroll in APs or, um, or other ways to, to, uh, to assist. I'm going to go to facilities. Uh, regarding calculating occupancy by the square footage of a room divided by the area of each student, this sounds like a math question already, Dwayne. Have you taken into this? Thank you. Have you taken into account the area that is required for furniture that occupies space? If you have not done this, the occupancy of each room will be slightly too high. We have, and we've we've actually gone into classrooms, and I can't thank our principals enough, and, and actually some of our our teacher leaders as well to set up a classroom, uh, measure it, and then um, make sure we have six feet apart in each column and then each row, front, back, side, side, in addition to the square footage. We've also asked our, our teachers and principals to look at classrooms and remove as much furniture as possible so that we can have as much open space as possible. We have five minutes. Uh, will more parking passes be made available since not as many students will be attending in-person classes each day? If so, how do we apply for a parking pass? Uh, that's a really good question. I don't even think that we have thought about that. Maybe the high school principals have, which we do not have here yet. I think the high school principals have begun to think about uh, parking arrangements at each high school and, and recognize that that needs to be part of both their arrival and dismissal plan. Yeah. There's another question about high school parking be handled. Um, I expect more students will be driving. We're, we are working with our director of operations, our health and safety uh, committee to make sure that 
we provide uh, what's necessary for students to be safe in and out of the parking lot. Uh, this is a kindergarten question. How will things be handled for kids that are ahead of the curriculum or behind? Sure. This could be a question about kindergarten kids coming to us any year. Um, kindergarten children come to us with a very wide range of academic and developmental readiness and skills, and our kindergarten teachers are brilliant at meeting their needs. Um, so we will continue to do that um, just as we, as we always do. How much interaction, if any, will elementary students have with each other on an average day? Will there be sharing of toys, manipulatives, etc.? There, there will be, and, and so as we work on our health and safety plan, one of the uh, elements of the health and safety plan is the disinfecting that needs to occur um, between use, um, the importance of hand washing, hand sanitizing, um, cleanliness uh, of, of the room, and being responsible with uh, social distancing. Sean, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, I think you, you've hit all the points. Um, you know, when it, yeah, I, I don't know that I can really add any more. That, that covers everything from what I think. How is social distancing planned for lunch periods? Depending on the level, we do have cafeteria plans for elementary, middle, and high school. There will be seats for students uh, and options for where they go, again, depending on the level. At the high school level, we are planning on using the auditorium, the cafeteria, the gyms, and maybe one other large space area where seats are six feet apart. We're working with food service uh, where Students will have more grab-and-go type things uh, for breakfast in the morning and for, for lunches. More than likely, we'll have more limited options of choice for students for lunches. Uh, at the middle and um, middle level, students will most likely walk down to the cafeteria, pick up their lunch or a snack, and then go back to the, the classroom, which, again, would have uh, desks that are six feet apart. We and at the elementary level, uh, we have just a couple um, different plans for maybe different buildings. And they range from uh, students walking down with their class to pick up their lunch to lunches being delivered to the class. Uh, the ability to use the cafeteria to, to spread out uh, will work in some buildings but not others. Students may go outside uh, at times. Uh, but for the elementary and the middle primarily, uh, their lunches will be in the classroom. I would also say that because of um, the fact that their masks are not on, the social distancing is, is pretty important during that time. There's, there's a lot to go into the cafeteria and lunches. Uh, we also have snacks that we're contending with at the elementary level. All of them equate to... Um, making sure that we're disinfecting and hand washing before and after uh, we eat. We're looking into a product for, I believe, the elementary level um, where students will uh, lay a material down on their desk and then their uh, lunch will go on top of that. So we're, we're, we're looking at how we're handling uh, refuse and and, um, and and the process for reducing the amount of um, any contamination from, from, from eating and making it easy for the students to throw out their garbage. Uh, so hygiene, disinfecting, um, throwing away garbage are, are all going to be important uh, areas for, for lunches. Will students be able to go see teachers during their lunches for support? I, I'm assuming this is a secondary question where this is a very frequent occurrence and how students get um, some extra help from classroom teachers. And while we haven't discussed it explicitly in our planning committee, my expectation would be with a pass from the teacher and being very controlled about numbers of students because what we won't allow for are just kids in hallways. Um, we just have to be, you know, continue to be controlled in, in social distancing and whatnot. But we also don't want to limit kids' access to support when they need it. That's really important for us. Thank you. 
So it's been one hour, and we've uh, asked or we've we've answered approximately half of the questions. If I would recommend that if you were on this uh, during this forum, that you attend to six o'clock, and we'll continue from there. And I think that at that point, we would have all questions uh, and answers complete, and we'll have both of these forums uh, posted to our website hopefully by tomorrow, so you'll be able to have the robust uh, amount of all questions that, that are answered. I also want to make sure that, that I'm uh, clear when, when we talked about transparency. I, I, I think that um, I heard from, from one parent that there's a concern that there's not a screen where we're seeing, we're seeing live questions come in. Uh, we are collecting live questions. I, I think that's important for, for you to know. Um, but we're also answering all the questions that have been submitted for the last two days. We've also submitted the questions that have been uh, asked for the last uh, several weeks. We're doing our, our diligence. We're doing our best uh, to keep the community informed. And I want to conclude by um, just saying that the um, th th this is a, a, a huge um, undertaking for all of us. And uh, I, I can't thank the people around this table and the people that are watching this enough uh, for having such an investment um, for our organization, for our kids, for, for one another. So with that, I thank you, and we will see you at 6 o'clock.